All righty, welcome everybody. Uh, just before I call the meeting to order, I will let you know that uh, this meeting will be held virtually and available for public viewing uh, via YouTube Live. And as part of the public participation, if you have any questions regarding items on the agenda for tonight, please submit them by email at mail at ektwp.ca. That's our mail at our, uh, our website. Questions received prior to the meeting will be addressed during the public question period as well. And the public question period is limited to uh, 15 minutes. So at this time, I'm going to move to um, officially call the meeting to order. And the first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. I'm looking for a mover for the motion to accept the agenda, Councillor Smith, and a seconder. And I see Councillor Predijon. So moved by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Predijon, that the regular meeting of council agenda dated May 11th, 2020 be adopted. All those in favor? And opposed? Okay, that motion is carried, thank you. All righty, moving on to item three, declaration of pecuniary interest. Does any member of council have an interest in any item on tonight's agenda? And if so, please state the nature thereof in general terms. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the adoption of the uh, minutes. Looking for a mover to accept the minutes from our last meeting. Okay, Councillor Brayton and seconded by Councillor Edie. So moved by Councillor Brayton, seconded by Councillor Reedy, that the regular council meeting minutes dated April 27th, 2020 be approved. Are there any comments, questions, concerns, or corrections with regards to that set of minutes? Okay, seeing none, then I'll go ahead and call the question. All those in favor? Okay, and opposed? Okay, that's carried, thank you. You wanna tell me what we're doing with these things? Oh yeah, for the benefit who uh, uh, those who may be wondering what the uh, colored batons are for, we have two counselors that are training for um, a relay marathon uh, this summer. No, I'm kidding. That's so that uh, because the uh, the camera is so far away from the actual council table, it's to make it obvious when uh, when they're raising their hands, and it's just it's a little bit easier for me out of the corner of my eye as well, depending on where I'm looking. So that's what they're all about. All righty, moving on to item five. We do have, uh, we did have a tender out for uh, road work contract number PW 2020-02. And uh, one of the things that we've had to do with regards to uh, COVID-19, uh, we did accept the, uh, the tender responses by email. So I do have two of them here. Uh, the first one is from G Tackaberry and Sons. And I see that, um, these are broken down into a number of, uh, of different figures. It would take quite a while to itemize each one, but I do see, it looks like there's a grand total that I may be able to quote here. So from G Tackaberry and Sons, the grand total is 415,644 cents. That's 415,644 cents. And that says in brackets, including HST. <clears throat> The second one that we received via email is from Coco Paving Incorporated. And they list their grand total for all five elements as 438,553 and one cent. That's 438,553 and one penny. And again, that's including HST. To our administrator clerk, we're I see, uh, does our uh, director of public works have anything that he wishes to add at this time regarding the tenders? Um, yes, I do. I, I just wanted to point out the fact that uh, um, um, despite the fact that St. George Street was supposed to be um, de deferred to 2021, it, it did end up getting into this um, um, tender. Um, at this point, we, we would like to ver verify uh, the total costs and what the overall uh, uh, budget is and, 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 and then see if uh, we can leave it in as part of this uh, scope of work. 
Okay, so uh, let me ask a, a question about that, uh, Director. My recollection, and I could be wrong because uh, my memory is fading with everything going on these days, but I think we talked about doing St. George out of our operating budget, but we would still need some costs around having that work done. So is my recollection uh, correct on that? And this boils down to where in our budget we would actually pull the money from? Uh, yes, that is uh, right. And um, the work that we would be, be um, doing um, in-house would be to just uh, re re repair uh, one spot that has um, settled. Um, there would be minimal cost. Okay, fair enough. So um, I see here that uh, if you don't have anything further that you need to add, I see here that uh, we're about to put a motion on the table to refer this to, uh, to staff. So if any council members have any uh, discussion items, we can handle that once the motion is on the table. So at this point, I'm looking for a mover uh, that the uh, request for tender submissions be uh, referred to staff. And so Councillor Smith and a seconder, uh, Councillor E. So moved by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor E that the regular request for tender submissions for road work be referred to staff. So with that now, any comments or questions? Yes, Councilor Brayton. Wasn't that put in a budget a couple of years ago or what happened to that? Did it go back into reserves or? Are you talking specifically for St. George? St. George, yeah. I, I believe so. Our administrator clerk, I think <clears throat> may have some insight here. Um, I believe this is extra work on top of what, what we did a couple of years ago in partnership with the county. No, 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 this okay. was, this was, this was just about in front of Councillor Johnson's house between him and Gary Bates. And there was a hunk of in there that was supposed to be leveled out. There's water collected in there and it's been at least two years that it was supposed to be fixed. And it had to be, it was, we must have figured out having a, there was some budget somewhere and it, where did it go to like it's, it did it go in the back into reserves or, or was it over or what I, I don't know no I don't, I don't I'm going to put our director of finance on the spot I don't know that she would have ready access to a specific piece of information like that but uh, uh, director do you have any any comments here that might help us out uh, thank you Mr. Mayor I know uh, St. George Street has been in the budget in the past um, I think most recently two years ago um, we, uh, I can't recall uh, what what the detail of the um, project was at that time. I would have to get back to council. Right, council right in the follow-up. I, I know that there was ditch work done. There was a filter bed put in six or seven years ago. There may be a little bit longer than that, and it was torn out and not replaced. And that should have been some kind of a saving somewhere along. So like I, there should be money somewhere, I, I would think. So maybe what, uh, what I might suggest is that since these things are being referred to staff okay. when the report comes back, perhaps we can get the question answered in more detail. Yeah, that, that would be fine. All right, any other member of council have any questions or comments regarding this before I call the question? All right, all those in favor? And opposed? Okay, that's carried, thank you. Can these people see these things? Oh yeah, they, yep. Yep, okay. More than one missed now. <laughs> thank you for cheap. All right, so now we're moving on to uh, item six, which is uh, reserved for our delegations. And we have two delegations this evening. Uh, up first should be Sheldon Seeley regarding Kitley line two. So there we go. I see you've joined the, the meeting now. So the, the virtual podium is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Um, as you've indicated, my name is Sheldon Seeley. I'm a detective with the Ontario Provincial Police and I've been a resident of Kitley Line 2 since uh, July of 2009. Your Worship, Mayor Brant Burrow and Councillors with Elizabethtown Kitley, uh, I wish to address this council meeting on behalf of myself and the majority of the residents of Kitley Line 2. Our main concern is with the condition and depreciable deterioration of the subgrade, aggregate surface, and the ditches of the current gravel road. We're requesting your consideration for 
either a yearly regular routine maintenance of the crowned driving surface of the roadway, shoulders and ditches, um, and that we are also concerned with the proposed budget for the tar and chip resurfacing project on Kitley Line 2, which was scheduled for the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a reference in the brothel recorder in Times, February the 5th, which was from a uh, council meeting held on February 3rd, indicating that there was a $160,000 uh, uh, surplus, or not surplus, but $160,000 uh, bursary or whatever to be used for that project. Uh, I guess what our concern there is, will there be any additional funding so again, there was some mention here earlier with respect to uh, previously allotted uh, road budget to uh, supplement that $160,000. Uh, and again, that's to address the subgrade rehabilitation and ditching. And it's not along the entire five kilometer stretch of Kitley Line 2, but rather in specific areas where uh, when extensive work was done back in 2008 and 2009 uh, and was never uh, finished in my opinion appropriately um, so I guess what I'm asking is if this proposal has been uh, approved will the hundred and sixty thousand dollar budget actually cover the cost of, of what it would take to tar and chip but also uh, do proper ditching and subgrade and aggregate surface in the in the specific areas that I'm talking about. Um, and that would include obviously uh, grading depths to remove the aggregate surface that's there presently, uh, the depth of the base material, how many lifts of tar and chip would that cover? Uh, will there be a cap sealer? And will there be uh, filling in the driveway ends? Uh, our questions are, how was this proposed budget determined? Was it based on a road study? And by what method was the information gathered? We're concerned that uh, will there be a continual routine maintenance, maintenance budgeted for after completion of this project to justify the ends? meaning the shoulders and ditching and resurfacing with the cap sealer. If it is uh, not been approved and we continue to use the gravel road the way it is, um, I would like to point out that there is poor subgrade materials there which have been weakened due to moisture. Uh, it's been improper routine maintenance done to keep the crown, the shape, and compaction of the current gravel. Um, a lot of it, if you drive by my residence, you'll see there's gravel laying in the ditch that has been pushed there by the snow plow and grader as it has uh, gone down the road in, in weeks, months, and uh, years past. At one point, I could mow my ditch, and I can no longer mow my ditch because of the amount of gravel that's been thrown into the ditch. There's marginal gravel depths in various locations along Kitley Line 2. And currently, as well as uh, previous years, there's a buildup of a secondary ditch, and that's due to improper maintenance and grading. Um, again, it's a poor aggregate surface, contains a high content of clay, and that's holding the moisture, and it's causing a slick surface, which is not unlike driving in slush or wet snow. Uh, especially after a heavy rain or in the obvious in the spring of the year when uh, the roads start to thaw out. This clay sticks to the surface of the vehicles and it's unlike any other regular road dust as I'm sure you can imagine which in uh, return causes a high uh, resulting in a high maintenance fees for uh, vehicle owners that uh, other residents that live on Kitley Line too. This aggregate surface, during my research, shows that it should be comparable amounts of fractured stone, sand, and fine particles, and then compacted properly. And we're not seeing that on Kitley Line 2. The current condition 
yearly, not seasonally, is no longer tolerable by many, if not all the residents of Kitley Line 2, of which many on average have two or more family vehicles. The last extensive work done on Kitley Line 2 was during the summer of 2008, where the west end of Line 2 was ditched and subgrade rehabilitation and aggregate surface. In 2009, the east end of Kitley Line 2 was ditched, subgrade rehabilitation and aggregate surfaced. And I had been told when I moved in in 2009 uh, that there had been plans for 2010 after having uh, two years for compaction that it would be tar and chipped. And we have yet to see any tar and chip placed on Kitley Line 2. And as a result of uh, improper road maintenance over the last 10 years, uh, that extensive road work that was done has deteriorated once again. Uh, I was told by a previous council member, as well as a previous road foreman for the township, that road rehabilitation on Kitley Line 2 had been designated as a three-year plan with an Ontario government supplemented project, which included the ditching, the subgrade rehabilitation, and the tar and chip resurfacing. We, the, kit, uh, the residents of Kitley Line 2, hope that this proposed resurfacing project will consider budgeting for complete and proper rehabilitation where required, and that the tar and chip resurfacing is not a Band-Aid solution for a short duration. And then in five years, we're back here where we are now before you, Mr. Mayor and council members pleading for consideration yet again. Um, I do know that in the summer of 2008, there was a government sign erected at the west end of Kitley Line 2, which discussed the Ontario government supplemented project. And that sign, believe it or not, recently disappeared after the 2018 election and a number of campaign councillors had attended my residence uh, as well as residents of, of Kitley Line 2 and spoken to people who had pointed out the sign to them. Um, also, it disappeared shortly before the government supplemented sign that appeared on Kitley Line 3 during the resurfacing project on Kitley Line 3. If at all possible, we, the delegation of residents at Kitley Line 2, would like to be made apprised of the proposed timeline, start dates, progression dates, and completion dates in writing. Might I take it at this point that uh, that concludes your presentation, sir, or? Uh, I just, uh, if you can give me a half a second, I'm just reviewing some notes that I've made. Certainly. Um, the, the poor quality of Kitley Line 2 at one, at one point in, In March of 2019, there was a tiered response, fire and OPP, to an emergency situation, a 911 call at the east end of Kitley Line 2. Fire attended the west end, just beyond the paved portion of uh, County Road 29, and refused to attend any further down the uh, Kitley Line 2 with a full-sized fire truck due to the condition of the road. The OPP officer attended from the east end of Kitley Line 2 and was followed shortly after by a volunteer firefighter. And I can't speak to whether he appeared in his own personal vehicle or a fire vehicle, but it was a pickup truck, not the full size. Fortunately, as it turned out, there was not any emergency 
and the fire truck did not need to attend. However, uh, our concern is if the road is maintained in that condition, we may have further incidents of the like in the future. Uh, during my uh, petitioning, I, I guess, and canvassing of residents of Kitley Line 2, I had the opportunity to speak with Mr. Bill Guy, who's, the, who's also a current resident on Kitley Line 2 and a manager of engineering and operations for the United Counties of Leeds and Granville Rose Department. Mr. Guy did not sign our petition because he was made aware of, uh, at the time, of the $160,000 budget for the project for resurfacing by tar and chip. Uh, I had inquired with Mr. Guy some of our concerns and he indicated that the $160,000 would likely cover two lifts of tar and chip. Uh, Mr. Guy also indicated his opinion that there was a solid enough subgrade base. However, the aggregate surface materials would require removal, new scaling, and aggregate materials uh, replaced before tar and chip. And he also indicated that a cap sealer would be laid down in that budget. I've also spoken with a uh, road building foreman for Cavanaugh Construction and inquired with him when uh, they do road surfacing, tar and chip, what, uh, where they get their quote from. I was told it was through cocoa paving and the rough quote that they provided for a five kilometer stretch for tar and chip, um, aggregate surface removal and replacement and filling in the end driveways with four inches of uh, granular A, seven eighths gravel uh, would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of approximately $227,000. I wanna reference uh, Brothel Recorder and Times, the headline roads projects in priority from February the 11th. And uh, it, was, it was a quote by Councillor Eleanor Renault in reference to her suggested 1% increase in tax rate for the road budget. Uh, and she indicated that a 0% would only draw $41,500 in revenue. And I quote, an extra $41,000 doesn't go very far. It won't even do a half kilometer, unquote. We use that formula. Our road is five kilometers long and would require approximately $410,000, which is obviously nowhere close to the $160,000 budgeted. Doing the job that I do, I am aware of a number of uh, motor vehicle accidents that have taken place along Kitley Line 2 in the last 10 years as a result of, and I realize there are many factors involved, but one of those factors is definitely the condition of the road. There are no shoulders. Um, where there are shoulders, there, the graders have taken the uh, aggregate surface below the ditches, creating what's called a secondary ditch where the water continues to lay. Um, we haven't had rain in a couple of days, but a little bit of snow. Uh, you can drive along Kitty Line 2 currently and still see puddles of water, which in my opinion should not be happening if the road is maintained properly. I will point out that, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, a number of residents of Kitley Line 2 have contacted council uh, or Elizabeth Town Township with respect to the condition of the road uh, since probably last fall, but it's been ongoing for a number of years. And I can say that there has been some improvement with respect to the number of times we've seen a grader on the road. Uh, I'm not sure if that's as a result of uh, us constantly calling and uh, I guess for lack of better terms, complaining about the condition of the road, but we have seen an improvement uh, in prior to uh, the your council being elected in 2018 in the spring I contacted the former mayor Jim Pickard and I spoke to him personally and asked him to drive down our road 
it was in the spring, but uh, that particular year was really bad. And again, I make reference to the amount of clay on the surface, which created that slush-like driving condition. And uh, Mayor Pickard at the time contacted me back and indicated that there would be uh, gravel put down on Kitley Line 2 at the time. They did not cover the full five kilometer stretch. In fact, they were about a kilometer and a half short of the entire stretch. And uh, shortly after that, Grader went by and shoved all that fresh gravel off into the ditches and it remains there present day. So at, at this point, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, we do have two delegations and I have- I understand fully you, your worship and uh, that'll conclude my comments at this point then. All right, so as is uh, tradition, I'll uh, ask if any member of council wishes to address the delegation or has any questions for him at, at this point. I would have our director of public works. Okay, so then uh, our director of public works, would you like to respond in any any fashion at this point? Uh, yes, um, I would uh, just like like to say that uh, the hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollar budget was uh, solely for the uh, surface treat treatment work. All of the uh, subgrade re re repairs and uh, um, um, graveling would occur from other uh, parts of the budget. Um, all of this is scheduled and. Not only that, but uh, we did, uh, we have ident identified a few spots where the um, drainage does need to, to be fixed and that will happen as, as well, all before um, the surface treat treatment happens. Okay, and I see uh, Councillor Brayton did have a one in on this. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think the $160,000 was a guesstimate. It probably might go over that a little bit. Uh, I think the, uh, some of the ditches in these whole ramming to get, to get the rock out of there to make the ditches feasible to, to get it and uh, work right. Uh, the turn chip, it's, they say they say it's supposed to last for five years, and uh, we look at them. Our roads, all our turnship roads, after five years, and and at that time uh, we pretty well have to do them to save the roads. But we put into the roads, uh, we don't build them up to let them go downhill. So we we got to keep them up. So. The, I think if the, if we do the thing right, like uh, our director of public works says, uh, there will be most of the work will, will coming from the township on our dollar. Uh, that's nothing to do with the hundred sixty thousand. I don't know. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that when we put our spring stone on. There would be stone going on it, and then we'd probably put four or five inches of fresh stone after that. So I, I, I'm quite satisfied. With, I've been a proponent of, of this road for quite a while, and I'm quite satisfied when when we get it done that it'll be done right, and, and uh, the people on mine too will be satisfied with it. But, but, as far as $160,000, that, that, that's a rough guesstimate. Uh, it gives us uh, gives us an idea how much money to budget for. If, we, if somebody says it's 160000 we don't budget forty or 50000 over that. But sometimes we have to come up with a little extra. So uh, I, I feel quite, quite uh, safe in, in saying that the road will be done right when we're going to get it done. Uh, and after four or five years, after five years, we'll, uh, if it needs to be done again, it'll be done again. So uh, that's one thing that 
I myself try to be very careful about all uh, this asphalt road because we've still got to keep up all these uh, turn chip roads, uh, hard surface roads. So I kind of think that uh, everything's going good as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. I see Thanks. Councillor Linton wants in on this as well. Through you, your worship, to our director of the roads. Um, can you give us some kind of a, like a ballpark, what, what you're figuring on this is gonna cost other than the actual budget? Um, besides the um, uh, gravel that's going to be going down on that that road here soon because they are moving up to to that to that end uh, shortly um, the ditching work that I had in mind uh, with the whole ramming was going to cost ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars and the additional gravel um, uh, we, we, we will be putting more on uh, as part of our regular um, good graveling pro program. Um, and then at that time, we will assess the, the, the actual uh, road structure. Um, and if there's any uh, uh, repairs that need to, to happen, uh, that will happen. Um, the fact that we're just putting on um, um, gravel now doesn't really impact it much because uh, that that can be easily moved, uh, the subgrade fixed, and then and then the gravel put put uh, back on. So um, it's kind of a, it's going to be a call in, a call in the field. Um, okay. How much how much re, re repair work we'll have to do? Okay. Just as a follow up to that, so when this project would be completed, would the ends of the driveways and everything be done as this gentleman has stated? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Brayton. I thought that, I thought that the only time that we'd done at the end of the driveways was if the driveway was paved, we would pave it again out to our road. But I don't think that we have never we have never done the ends of the driveways on a hard surface that I know. Of. So what? Uh, uh, if I may say, uh, what 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 I mean by the uh, by the end of of the driveways being done is that uh, they will be raised up to to match the um, a new grade uh, with gravel. Yeah, with gravel. Yes. Hey, Councillor Smith. Yeah, I worship through to our delegation, Mr. Seeley. Um, Mr. Seeley, just, just so you're aware, we have received uh, quite a few emails by um, uh, Janet Trouble, who's been the chair of the committee out there in Kelly Line 2. And the emails have been started back in November. And um, in February, Ms. Trouble received an email outlining what we were doing and what surface treatment was all about. And, uh, and she has correspondence back and forth with staff and also it was directed to me as chair of public works. She received a response from that as well. At the public works <coughs> meeting last week, uh, we discussed this project and uh, each resident on Killing Line 2 will be receiving information on this project and what's happening. So just uh, an FYI, uh, that was all discussed uh, at uh, Public Works uh, Committee of the Whole meeting last Monday. Thank you, Your Worship. Hey, uh, anybody else before I just make one final comment and we'll, then we'll move on to our uh, next delegation. Okay, so yeah, the, the final comment that I'd like to make is uh, I wouldn't necessarily expect uh, residents who, who follow the proceedings of council through the newspaper to understand all the nuances of the way the budgets are put together. And, you know, when a, a soundbite appears in, a, in an article uh, without all the, the proper context of what's gone on in the meetings leading up to it, um, 
especially in your line of work, I'm sure you can appreciate that things are not always as they seem on the on the surface. And so I can say I sat in the public gallery for six years learning, you know, many of those nuances. And so I'm not surprised that when you see $160,000 as a budget, you wouldn't necessarily realize that that that's what we call the capital side of things and all the rest of this would go on. And so I can understand to a certain extent, you know, your trepidation for what you saw and what you may have feared was coming. Um, but I can provide you with the same assurances that uh, my two colleagues in the chamber have, have already said. Uh, I th think you'll be pretty satisfied with the work that you see go on uh, under the direction of our director of public works. And I think you'll be pretty satisfied with the condition of the road and the way we maintain it going forward. I don't want to see us spend good money and then have to respend good money, you know, doing something over again that we should have done right the first time. I think I'm pretty confident we'll do it right the first time. We'll keep up to it. So thank you for your time today and your presentation and hang tight. You'll be receiving a, a letter soon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So I think in the waiting room now we have our uh, second delegation. So this would be uh, uh, Julie Severant from the executive director uh, for the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network. And so I'll welcome you virtually to our our podium and look forward to your presentation. Hi, thank you. Um, so as mentioned, my name is uh, Julie Servin and I'm working for the Frontenac Arch Biosphere. And we presented to council in February, 2019. And <clears throat> we went back to, um, well, we went to the county in the fall of 2019 to request funding from the municipalities in and around the biosphere. And um, in response to that, we ended up sending out a letter asking uh, for, for support. And so the presentation today is to, as requested by council, is to um, summarize sort of what we've done and what we plan to do. And so I don't know if I can screen share. Um, share screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. We're just we're waiting a couple of seconds for our administrator clerk to return to the chambers, and she may have uh, control over screen sharing options. Our our delegation okay. is now asking if she can share her screen to control the slides. Can you see the um, presentation? Uh, just a minute. <laughs> um. Bear with us. You're, you're our guinea pig. This yes. is the first time that we're doing the slide deck sharing through this particular conferencing application. So no problem. It's my first time to <laughs> sharing this. Allison? Get up. Bear with us. We've just hollered downstairs to our expert. <laughs> okay, thank you. She is working on it. <laughs> Oh, look, there it is. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I just, I double clicked it instead. So maybe that's the key. Okay, so can you see the full thing right now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, um, so the From Neck Arch Biosphere region is located on the lands traditionally sustained by the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people. And um, as our society gains knowledge, access to knowledge, we're learning about pre-existing names of places and things, and that there were and still are pre-existing relationships. And I like this map. It's from the Decolonial Atlas online, and it shows place names in Ganya Gehaga, which is the Mohawk language. And so the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network, um, we also sit on at the table with the Eastern Ontario First Nations Working Group. And this is to discuss potential projects and collaborations with First Nations. And that meets, um, I think it's quarterly. Uh, so then the Frontenac Arch Biosphere region is 2,700 square kilometers. It extends from Gananoque to Brockville and um, north of Kingston from Verona to Westport and over to Athens. It's a large area, mostly characterized by its geological foundations and a high level of biodiversity. Um, and the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network has been uh, an established UNESCO biosphere since 2002. 
in um, so biosphere reserves undergo a rigorous periodic review every 10 years and ours was in 2017 where we received um, and then and we received recognition that UNESCO renewed our Frontenac Arch Biosphere Reserve designation in the fall of 2019. So we're very excited about that. Um, it, uh, our volunteer board of directors contributed a lot of personal time and effort to get the renewal. And from this exercise, we also learned um, how to work together as a group, that the organization needs a succession plan. And we developed an Excel-based information management structure to keep better track of our activities and our networking and community outreach. Um, in the past, we've participated in outreach events at the national and local levels. Uh, outreach and networking take a lot of time, travel and capacity, and no grants cover this work and it's taxing on volunteers. Some of the outreach activities we have participated in or led um, are the Linterest Turkey Fair, Turtle Box Building at Mallory Town, the La Tournelle Mentorship Day with the uh, Cataroqui Region Conservation Authority um, and Christmas Bird Counts for Kids at both Landon Bay and Mac Johnson, the Sydenham Lakes and Trails Festival and the ADA Conservation Action Planning Workshops. Um, we do call ourselves the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network um, because we as networking and because networking and relationship building are integrated into most of our activities. Uh, we recently organized an advisory council um, with some of our partners and that is and we meet quarterly for that as well and the purpose of the council is to help guide our activities strategically and to prevent duplication of work um, we've also taken time to present to municipal councils to increase awareness and the potential of working with and supporting the front neck arch biosphere um, so for education, uh, Nature Camp was started in 2018 through an Ontario Trillium Foundation grant, and we were able to hire a full-time program manager for three years to run the program, as well as four to six part-time positions in the region. 2020 is the last year of funding, and we're seeking additional funding to supplement the program for the next one to three years until revenues can be generated to support the staff. Um, this is considered a social enterprise activity, and we would like to engage in more of these. Um, so that's social enterprise activity is one in which you can you generate revenues, but you then reinvest those revenues into the mandate of the organization. Um, and so the Nature Camp program has been also been integral to increasing our outreach activities and to getting families involved in outdoor experiences. Um, we've also collaborated with many organizations and municipalities, including Elizabethtown Kitley. Um, <clears throat> we provided other educational experiences for students in elementary schools, high schools, and university. Uh, 2019 was the last year of a nine-year partnership with Queen's University School of Environmental Studies, but we hope to work uh, closely with the staff and students at Queen's again. Um, sustainable tourism. So supporting sustainable tourism through our Amazing Places program. Amazing Places is a national biosphere initiative that creates a tangible experience for visitors, visitors and residents. Um, the aim is to connect people with the natural and cultural heritage in the biosphere region. Um, we also amalgamated our former FAB Experiences website with the FAB website. So everything is together and now we have all our hiking, cycling, paddling, diving, and tour maps in one section. And each map has an accompanying, accompanying PDF and links to the stewards of each trail. So that's like land trusts, conservation authorities, and parks. Um, as a not-for-profit, we know it is our responsibility to fundraise a portion of our revenues to support the organization. And last year, we initiated a Fab Trails Festival with the, and the purpose of this event is to fundraise, but also to increase awareness that we're in a UNESCO biosphere region. Um, it is uncertain whether or not we will be able to hold a Fab Trails Festival this year, but it's still being planned. And this year it would, it would take place from August 21st to 23rd, culminating in a harvest dinner for 40 people. So still like a moderate um, fundraising event. 
Um, and we also received, last year, we received a generous donation from Burn Bray Farms, which is a, I'm sure you know, <laughs> is a local and national family run egg farm. Uh, so moving forward, so for the immediate future, um, we've decided to build on previous work of the biosphere, which includes outreach and networking, uh, education opportunities, including the Nature Camp and the Youth Climate Summit, uh, field study courses, and sustainable development focused on trails and local flavors. So in addition to the Nature Camp program, we initiated a Youth Climate Action Summit. So this is based off the Wild Center's Youth Climate Program in Tupper Lake, New York. Um, and the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network took five students and two faculty from BCI in November 2019 to attend the Wild Centers Conference uh, and financial support was provided by the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Foundation. And the intention was to hold a summit in Brockville and which we were well on our way to planning. And now that it's been, it's been postponed to October 5th and 6th, um, it's still tentative whether or not that's gonna happen. <clears throat> um, but it's a free summit for um, up to 100 students where they can come and uh, learn about climate action and be empowered to uh, make change in their own communities. Uh, our plans for 2020 uh, also include uh, Nature Camp, the Trails Festival, um, relaunching local flavors in addition to outreach and networking activities. So of course, due to SARS-CoV-2 restrictions, we have gotten inventive with our social media and have been posting activities and information oh. for um, April was Earth Month. And we're partnering, partnering with the Gananoque Library and Fulford Academy to host a live World Bee Day on celebration on May 20th um, on Facebook. And we've also applied for a grant to work with the Gananoque Chamber of Commerce, um, sort of a we, we applied jointly um, to organize uh, tourism, like a tourism collaboration for this region and, and see what we can work out there. So the long-term objectives in the more distant future, we'd like to demonstrate how the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network is contributing to the sustainable development goals and the Canada biodiversity targets. Ideally, our future projects and programs will align with these and other international targets, demonstrating how they can be implemented at the local level. At the same time, to ensure our financial sustainability, we need to make, take on a number of social enterprise activities to generate revenue that can then be reinvested in the organization and the UNESCO mandate. Um, the National Network of Canadian Biosphere Reserves has created a communications and branding strategy to achieve consistency in messaging and projects among Canadian biospheres. And it's hoped that this will increase the national presence of Canadian biospheres, um, of which there are 18. So we're asking municipalities to help contribute to the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network's core operating requirements, <clears throat> as many grants will not contribute to overhead costs, such as non-project management, um, board of director insurance, and website maintenance. Um, we've, we've received funding from three municipalities so far, Brockville, Gananoque, and Front of Young. Our past activities are also being documented in our annual reports, which could be accessed online on our website if you want to know more. And uh, the 2019 report is coming shortly. Um, yeah, so in order to report back to municipalities who are um, providing support, we're developing um, like an evaluation procedure to measure our impact and quantify our efforts. So if municipalities become more involved with the biosphere, there's opportunities to work on joint projects that are of value to the region. Um, in return for an annual contribution, biosphere municipalities are dem demonstrating support for the environment, green economy, climate change action, and sustainability of communities. Um, and just to sort of uh, prove like, to show you that the, the core operating costs are not covered, our program manager for Nature Camp is full-time uh, for three years. It's a three-year contract. And I've been working uh, between 10 and 30 hours part-time, depending on, <laughs> I'm, I'm personally flexible to be able to do this work. So I've been able to go down to 10 hours um, when I've had to, but not, I don't think 
I don't think that that is desirable. <laughs> so que um, questions. Okay, well, thanks for the presentation. And so now um, we'll, oh, good. So we've returned to where I can see everybody. So now I'll ask the members of council if they have any uh, questions or comments for our presenter. Sorry, Councillor Eady. Hi, I just want to thank you for your presentation. Can you refresh my memory? Was there um, an actual amount of money you guys were looking for? Yeah, so what we did was um, we broke it up by um, per capita percentage for each of the municipalities located within or partly within the biosphere. And so um, Elizabethtown Kitley has 12.15% uh, of the population in the biosphere. And so we were asking for 3,887. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and I saw Councillor Renault, you had your hand up. Okay. Yeah, Christine asked my question. I was wondering what the ask was. Okay, so I have a, a question for our presenter. Oh, sorry, Councillor Freddie John. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. I, I was looking at the long term objectives and the sustainable development goals, and I'm sure over a course of time they would be, but do you have a hard and fast plans yet on how you, you know, like, that's a big initiative. There's 17 of them here and, you know, yeah. to have no poverty, the first one, do you have plans on how that's gonna happen or? So, how, oops, sorry. That's my question, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm kind of working with the uh, Canadian Biosphere Reserves Association. So that's the national level. And um, we've picked out I think there's four or five sustainable development goals that is that actually apply to um, how bios like what biospheres can actually uh, do and it, like work towards. So it wouldn't be all 17. And it's also not we don't. Um, SD, what is it? SDG 17, 19 is partnerships, and that's like a major part of what we do. So it's not just working alone; it's working in partnership and communicating and networking with other organizations that are working on the landscape to be able to get things done. So the SDGs would be um, like, there's a handful of each, it wouldn't be both lists. And it would be more sort of strategic, I think nationally, rather than just kind of going off on our own. But we, as, as of now, that's a long-term objective. We don't have anything planned right now. Okay, so I have a question for you then, um, and it, it boils down to, to this. A little bit later in the agenda, we're going to be dealing ourselves with sort of an initial financial look at the impacts of the coronavirus uh, crisis, what that has done to us on the revenue side of things, and also what that has done to us on the cost side of things. Um, we've seen some of our costs go down, some of our costs go up, and so it, it's not a, an easy thing to just you know, put it in a, in a single statement. But I'm wondering, can you give us a sense of what the impact has been for you uh, on the revenue side and on the cost side? Uh, yeah, so as of right now, we are, we're okay. Like we're, we haven't lost revenues. Our main revenue generating program is nature camps. Um, so if, we aren't allowed to have summer camps. We've already canceled March break and we've canceled uh, school um, outreach programs that we had planned. So if we don't run summer nature camps, that's very much going to affect us. And also um, like we, we, um, we apply for grants and for funding and we got uh, some money to put on this youth climate summit. And so that's kind of, uncertain whether or not that's going to happen at this time. So there, there's a lot of uncertainty because a lot of what we do is going outdoors and being with the public and community outreach. So if um, sort of self-isolation and social distancing 
is going to be continuing or or happen again in the future, we almost have to start thinking about like a balance between um, activities that we can do sort of like a desktop type activity that doesn't involve being around groups of people and having the outreach and groups of people. And the Trails Festival might also get canceled as well, right? Which is supposed to be, we just initiated it as a fundraiser. So it wouldn't be very good if um, we weren't able to do that. But everything is uncertain right now. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yep, yep. it provides me with a, enough of a, of a sense of where things are, are at for you guys. Yeah. So I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to, to join us from uh, from your location. And uh, as is custom, Mary, when we have uh, uh, delegations, you know, we don't make a, a decision on the same night as the presentation is is done. So uh, council will consider this at some point in the in the future. Um, I don't know if you were around and, and listened to the delegation before you. The only reason it seems like a decision was made around that one was the decision decision had already been made. We were going ahead with the road anyway, and just so we were asking questions about it. But um, but yeah, thank you very much for for the information, and uh, we'll take it into consideration, and then we'll be back in touch. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening and for letting me be the screen sharing guinea pig. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. <you>. Thanks. <laughs> Have a good night. Too. Thanks you too. All righty, so that concludes our delegations for this evening. So we'll now move into section seven, which is our staff reports. We have two of them this evening. First one is uh, with respect to the integrity commissioner's annual report. So I'm looking for a mover and a seconder to receive that report. So moved by Councillor Renault, seconded by Councillor Linton. The, the, counts, uh, the report A-20-25 be received. So with the motion on the table, are there any comments or questions surrounding that report? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor? Okay, and opposed? That's carried, thank you very much. <coughs> okay. That next motion still wants to hide. All right, moving on to the second staff report. This is uh, the financial update related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking for a mover and a seconder uh, to receive that report, and then we can get into the discussion. Moved by Councillor Prettyjohn, seconded by Councillor Smith. That report F-20-07 be received. So with that motion on the uh, table, I'll go ahead and open up the floor for any questions or discussion. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'll just start out with a couple of comments. Uh, with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and staff, potential staff returning to work, I think the best solution is to keep working from home as long as possible to limit the number of people in the buildings. Be patient, be safe is key in reducing the COVID-19 cases or until a vaccine is available. So the best practice is to stay home, work from home, stay safe for everyone's uh, Help. I'd like to comment in regards to the purchase of plexiglass uh, to be proactive and ahead of the curve before the province orders all municipal governments back to the normal um, operating or open to the public. I will support the purchase and the installation of plexiglass only for the reception desk at the administration building, fire station one. Toledo Satellite Office and the three libraries, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions at, at this point? Yes, Councillor Pretty John. Um, through you to uh, Councillor Smith, when you say stay safe, stay home until such time as there's a vaccination, did I hear that? I'm having a little trouble hearing. Did I hear? And vaccination because that might be two years off are we going to do this for two years well i don't know I'm, gonna... I'm, not, I'm not the premier of ontario but from <sighs> listening to the premier and the minister of health and all the doctors who have been on ctv news across canada they are stating the best case is to stay home and to stay safe if possible if 
people or businesses are able to work from home without any disruptions in their operating, that is the best way of meeting the curve with the COVID-19. I must say, working for the counties, good example. We have approximately, I'll say 40% working from home right now. And the operation of the county is still operating as normal, even with people working from home. And we're still doing our social distancing as we are here tonight. And that's what it's gonna take until the government, until the government says, okay, municipal governments, buildings, you're open to the public, then we're all back to work and you're back to normal. But I think to beat the curve, we have to be proactive you may have to stay on this course for a while. We don't know that, but that's just working in the environment of it today. I say that's, I think that's what we have to do. Yes, it could be 12, 18 months down the road to see a vaccine. I don't know, but um, our cases are not um, going down. We're starting to hear some local cases. So I, I'm just, I'm being cautious. That's all I want to say. Thank okay, you. can I respond back to that? I, I okay. understand. I understand first through the mayor to Councillor Smith that no, you're not the premier, but the premier has made some decisions about opening walking trails, people's doing their social distancing. We may have one family being able to meet with another family. We still have people going into all the grocery stores. Um, it's been viewed that some stores, uh, I won't mention names are not doing the sanitizing properly. There are people out there saying, what are you wearing a mask for? It's not Halloween. There's all kinds of things going on with this. And you, to me, realistically, people are not going to put up with this for as long as you may think waiting for a vaccine. There are those that are saying if there's a vaccine, they're not gonna take it anyway. So, and I'm not suggesting we all get back into the chambers. That's not why I asked that. I just, you know, realistically, there's gotta be a happy medium because people are not going to stay the way this is forever. And forever to them is like another two months. And I'm not saying go out and do what you like. I'm just saying that there are some issues with people thinking like this is ridiculous. And it's a lot of it goes in age groups. That was all I was asking, thank you. Okay, anything else from council? Just uh, Councilor Smith. One more, Your Worship. And, um... It goes, goes to something that uh, Councillor Pritijan has um, alluded to with the provincial government announcing that cottagers um, should enjoy their seasonal residence. As we know, we have Bellamy Park. To some, it's a seasonal residence, but the government, uh, provincial government has uh, not opened campgrounds. And uh, I, uh, I do know that everyone enjoys the campground, and, but understand it does draw a crowd, perhaps a party of some sort, which is enjoyed by family and friends. But my, my concern with this one, and I just want clarification from our Madam Clerk, is that we are not collecting rent from our campers at this time. Is that correct? Through you to please go ahead, Madam Clerk. Absolutely. Um, there have been some campers that have provided last year provided a deposit um, whenever the camp does if it does open this summer when it does the rates will be adjusted accordingly and if a refund is um, needed uh, appropriate that will happen or they will be charged the balance of whatever the, the fee is but we're we're playing it by ear at this point okay thank you hey, any for yes uh, councillor freddy john Follow up, and then I think I saw Councillor Brickman in the corner of my eye here. Um, as far as the seasonal campsites, and I, I'm going to speak for Bellamy and as well as as Delta. Um, there, the suggestion that has been put forth is that maybe the the parks can be opened just to the seasonal campers, but then it would depend on the people that are the seasonal campers and also the people that are at the gate to make sure it's just the seasonal campers and they maintain their social distancing in their campsite, in their camper. I mean, 
I don't know how many right now are seasonal at Bellamy, but it, we, it would be only the seasonal. And that's the thought that um, has been put out there by a lot of people. I actually wrote to uh, our, or our provincial government myself to say something regarding that. So, I mean, if you can social distance at a cottage, if you can social distance here at the house, you can social distance at your camper. And if anybody didn't pop, do the social distancing, I guess they'd be sent home. It's like anything else. You can't have a fire after 11 and you keep doing it, then, then you're out. So it, it could be, it could happen, but I'm, I'm still waiting on the government to come down with what we can do and what we can't. And I've been watching that daily as well. Thanks. I see our administrator clerk uh, has a response to that. And then I see Councillor Linton after that. Uh, many, a number of our seasonal campers rely on our facilities. And when one of our members of staff, our, our recreation coordinator, has been sitting in on teleconference calls regarding uh, swim programs and public washrooms. And one of the things that would have to occur that they think will have to occur is that the washrooms would have to be sanitized every two hours. And that would be every public washroom within the park would have to be sanitized every two hours. And that's just what they're recommending at this point. Um, so the, the staffing time, um, we may end up having to have more staff to be able to just constantly be cleaning these the washrooms. That's one of the issues on it. And then the other is patrolling um, regularly to make sure that people are social distancing. Um, you saw what happened in BC, the, 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 the crowds that were going to the beaches that are basically closed, but how do you control that? Councillor Linton, excuse me, Councillor Linton. I'd just like to make a little point on the discussion. It's I think it's going to be in short amount of time here, even possibly the next week or so, that we're going to get a little bit more information as to how the province is going to move forward. Right now, I've in many discussions, for the life of me, I've never seen so many rules all over the map as they are right now. We have, we have businesses that are open up with hundreds of people in them. We have we have municipal projects moving forward that are removing asphalt and putting new pickleball courts down. And if that's not as not essential, I don't know what is. And then we have construction jobs that are going on at BGH that we don't even have. We have a surplus of major surplus of beds right now. So just to my point, everything right now is all over the map. And I think with some of those items that we've just talked about, I think clarification for that is coming soon. Thank you. And I saw Councillor Renault, you had your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Renault. Yep. I, I skipped right over Councillor Brayton. No, 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 go ahead. No, go ahead, Councillor Brayton, then we'll get to Councillor Renault. Well, I'm just going to say I've been locked up in a house with a woman for, for I don't know, eight or nine eight or nine weeks and I need a haircut. So there's, there's gonna, they're gonna have to open up the country or the economy, there would be nothing to open up. Uh, there'd be no jobs, be no nothing, there'd be no country. Like it, it can't go on forever. And hopefully they do it as, as safe as they can. But this test and I, I've <clears throat> heard some horror stories in, in Bravo that one guy, uh, he got tested and they said it would be 70% accurate. Well, 70% wouldn't be no good to me. Mm. So like, they've got to get their stuff together. And maybe it's a story, I don't know. But the government is, is the one that's shut it down. They're, they're the ones that are going to have to open it up. And then hopefully people have a job to go back to when they do open it up. And we can get back with some kind of, some kind of normalcy. And uh, carry on their lives but like a, uh, I know if I was living in the 10th floor of a uh, 400 unit apartment building I would like to go to my summer cottage but uh, I'm in a house and locked up for two months so like it's not the end of the world I've been eating pretty good so like 
It's just one, it's one of the wait and see deals and wait for the government, but they're they're coming. They're opening up things slow, and, and that, that's what they got to do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Now, Councilor Renault. Thank you. <clears throat> Two things. Uh, you've got your penalties and interest uh, that are waived right now. Uh, and that's waived till the end of this month. So that's income that we're not going to see, period. Right? Because people can pay after the end of May. So that's money that we wouldn't see. You might not have seen anyway because everybody may have paid on time. What I am wondering about is okay, people pay at the end of May for the rest of the year. Are we really owed any money for the rest of the year if everybody pays up from then on? Just to campers? No, uh, sorry, just to no, clarify. This is, this is the taxes. I have the question on the campers. Yeah, so this is the taxes uh, for all ratepayers right now. So I'm gonna refer that to our uh, director of, uh, of finance, but my understanding is that the recommendation is that we don't further waive the interest and penalties. And so going forward, those people who were in arrears who have now been treated as fairly as everybody else and have not had to pay interest or penalties during this deferral, those people who are still in arrears are going to go back to paying interest and, and penalties. That's sort of the recommendation. And anybody who now goes into arrears, if they go beyond the current May 22nd due date, they would start to incur penalties and, and interest. I believe that's where the recommendation is. Or if I just screwed that all up, Director of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through your through your worship to Councillor Renault. Um, so the we're recommending that we do not extend the due date. However, we're going to come back to Council with some um options for looking at those penalties on an ongoing basis whether we still need to provide some sort of relief or whether it can be staged or by application um, we'll have more information on that but for now i think we can um, maintain our current due date uh, at the end of may um, we are out the penalty and interest that we waived for uh, April and, Mar and May, um, so $33,000. So if we continue to waive penalty, um, it may be less if we waive penalty for people that are only uh, in a current position. Um, yeah, so uh, we can't get that $33,000 back. Uh, if we look at wa waiving them further, uh, the maximum we would be out would be $16,000 a month. So again, we are going to bring that back to council for the next meeting prior to the June 1st uh, resumption of penalties. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Does that answer your question, Councilor? Yeah, on that. And then the other question I have or statement I have is about the park. Uh, Councillor Prejohn suggested that perhaps maybe we could just let the uh, seasonals come in. We actually don't make enough profit on just the seasonals. We need um, the overnighters to actually make campground pay. And if we have to do everything that Yvonne is talking about and needing more staff, then we really would be in the hole. And would it be so I think the committee really has to take a look at, is it feasible to open under those conditions and lose more than we could ever get back? It, it's just something that has to be thought about and looked at before we just go forward. Okay, thank you very much. Did I see Councillor Frederick John? Did you have your hand up there? And then after you, I see Councillor Linton. Um, through you to um, um, Ms. Gordon, I'd like to know if uh, at the end of May, when people have had everything waived and there are some that can pay, but there are some that still can't pay or have not, you know, have the ability or don't pay or whatever, are there uh, interest and penalties going to be retroactive to when this started or we lost them entirely? 
the, the interest in penalties? Have we lost them entirely for everybody or will the ones that still can't pay, will it go back to the start? Something like if you get a loan at Leon's, if you don't pay at the same date, then you have to pay for all the interest, right? Thanks. Our director of finance. Uh, I don't believe the decision was to be retroactive with that penalty if they do not continue to pay. So uh, that that revenue would then be lost. Yeah, that's that's consistent with my understanding. When the, the emergency control group made those recommendations, it was it was uh, basically biting the bullet. Yeah. All right. Any uh, so I guess Councilor Linton, you're next. Just one point on the park. The uh, I guess I can't understand if we opened up for the regular seasonal campers what the difference, they would have to follow the social distancing and the rest of the rules that would be set in place that any overnight or weekend campers would be required to follow the same. Yeah, I guess, I guess the one distinction between the regular campers or at least the ones that make that their, their seasonal residents and the overnight campers would be um, the large influx from a much wider variety of who knows where it could be Ottawa or Toronto or a hotspot anywhere in the province or what have you. So there might be a distinction to be made there, I think. Um, but yeah, I can see that, that the committee is going to have to have a pretty detailed discussion. Um, and I take your point that you made earlier uh, to heart that hopefully in the next week or maybe two at the most, we'll get a lot more clear direction from the province because I can tell you that the amount of time that I'm spending now versus a few weeks ago, just trying to deal with, you know, two different topics that seem to be the same thing and yet they're being treated differently, even with within our borders or our borders compared to our next door neighbor or what have you, uh, that, that effort is going up and up and up every day. So, we'll, you know, I'm hoping that there's going to be some clarity from the province because it's starting to get a little muddy right now. All right, are there any other further questions from council on, on this report? I do have one, but I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Okay, so, um, so I know then uh, we've talked about the reduction in interest revenue from our bank accounts and investments, and that's not surprising given what's happened to interest rates and so on. I'm just wondering, I imagine you haven't had a chance yet to even consider what that might do in terms of opportunities to restructure uh, I'm thinking specifically now about Fire Station 3 or any of the other large ticket items. Am I right in assuming that our access to money for cash flow is much more affordable now than it was prior to, to COVID? So although we're losing the interest on our investments, we may also be gaining the, a little bit of an advantage on the other side of the books that we could take advantage of for, for cash flow. So any comment around that would be appreciated. Uh, so I haven't looked at the, the recent loan rates, but your assumption is correct. The, the rate should be down. Um, the budget is um, currently in the format that uh, we could either take that from reserves or uh, take a loan on that. In the current situation with COVID and the cash flows, I wouldn't recommend uh, taking those funds from reserves. So, um, yeah, that's, that's something we can certainly look at. Um, I would be cautious with some of the larger capital projects till we know uh, what our next due date's going to bring. So, you know, if we start to get in um, more cash flow um, and things are looking a little brighter, then, you know, I, I would think all seem ahead. Uh, but I would like to proceed cautiously till we have more information on, on where the economy is going to be and where employment will be locally. Um, as the report says, we're currently in a good financial position, uh, but we don't know where that's going to lead towards the end of the year. If, if you know, we do see a 25% reduction in uh, tax payments, then you know, we could be looking towards uh, some concern in early 2021. So um, I guess that's a long answer to your short question, but uh, yes, we could certainly, uh, in the right conditions, take uh, advantage of lower interest rates. I don't know that I've ever asked a short question in my life, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, but, and, 
as you're considering your report coming forward, I'm thinking specifically around the biggest ticket item that we've had in recent memory, and that would be Fire Station 3. Um, and I'm thinking we don't have much choice around that. That's been waiting for a number of years anyway. We have equipment on the way that, that we won't be able to fit into our current buildings if we don't get going on the new one and things like that. So at some point, if you can go back and, and revisit what the cost of borrowing is, if we lock into a debenture now versus what we thought it was going to be even three months ago, um, that may help to inform us uh, as to whether or not we can, for instance, and I'm only using this as a for instance, you know, we had budgeted, I think, roughly 95000 to come out of the, uh, the levy for this year towards the fire station. But if the overall cost of borrowing is going to be lower, and we think towards the end of the year, we might be a little uh, precarious cash flow wise, we may want to debenture the additional 95,000 and keep that 95 in terms of cash flow because at the end of the day, we're not gonna spend any more on interest than we thought we were anyway. And we just gained access to an extra almost $100,000. So it's those types of creative things, especially around that big ticket item that, that I'm starting to think about in the, in the back of my mind. So if you can keep that in mind when you're doing up your report, that'd be great. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I'll go ahead and call the question. All those in favor of receiving that report? Okay, and opposed? Thank you, that's carried. All righty, so we'll now move on to our uh, committee minutes. We have one set, so I'm gonna be looking for a mover and seconder to receive the uh, Public Works and Waste Management Committee, the whole meeting minutes. So uh, moved by Councillor Renault, seconded by Councillor Brayton, that the Public Works Waste Management Committee of the whole meeting minutes dated May 4th, 2020 be received. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns with that set of minutes, Council? All righty, seeing none, all those in favor? And opposed? That's carried, thank you. Alrighty, we don't have any uh, bylaws this evening with the exception of the confirmatory bylaws at the very end. Uh, we do have two correspondence items. And so I'm gonna be looking for a mover and seconder to receive and file item one and receive and support item two. So moved by Councillor Prettyjohn and seconded by Councillor Linton that the following correspondence item be received and filed, item one, and that the following correspondence item be received and supported Item two, any comments or questions with regards to item one, that being the uh, AMO Board of Directors? Yes, okay. Next one. All righty, and so any comments or questions regarding the second one? I see Councillor Smith was eager to get his baton up there, so we'll let you go ahead. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I support the Township of uh, Armour uh, resolution for rural internet, the need for high-speed internet connectivity in rural, uh, rural Ontario. Uh, Elizabeth Town Kelly has supported the installation of new communication towers, uh, but there are still areas in the township lacking high speed internet connectivity. Uh, COVID 19 has brought forth the importance of high speed internet connectivity, especially during the closure of the schools. Until schools are reopened, the future of children's learning is online, which is why high speed internet connectivity is important in rural Ontario. In the recorded time back in the think, start of April, when they closed all the schools down, one of the comments in the recorded times was that uh, the school board realizes that the, the high speed internet is not all through Ontario or Eastern Ontario. And if you wanted to connect to the internet, come to the parking lot of the child school. I don't think that was the right way of operating, but all I want to say is that we've been, we've been supporting High speed internet here in Elizabeth Town Kelly. I think we got to continue to do that, and I will support that resolution on the table, sir. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions around this item? All right, I'll go ahead and call the question then. All those in favor? And opposed? Okay, that's carried. Thank you. All righty. So we're moving on to section 11, informational items. Does any member of council have an information item to announce at this time? Yes, Councillor Smith. Uh, worship and, and members of council, uh, 
over the weekend, I received uh, uh, numerous complaints in regards to garbage and vehicles tearing up the fairgrounds in Rouse Corners. Um, the garbage containers are overflowing, consistent, consisting of residential garbage, which has been strung throughout the grounds by animals or strong wind. Vehicles are racing up and down County Road 6, turning into the fairgrounds and racing around the horse track. Um, it used to be a horse track and not a race car track. And other, some of these other issues that do occur from that, okay, and mischief is uh, drinking of alcohol on the premises and leaving beer bottles behind. And I must say, I do have photos from the weekend, which uh, have been passed on to our um, recreation coordinator. And um, therefore, uh, your worship and members of council, uh, some of these to me need to be addressed. Uh, and I think we need to give our staff some direction to clean up the park. I know that um, people enjoy walking their dogs there. Uh, but not all people are picking up their, uh, their animal waste. Um, I think purchasing of lids for the garbage containers is a must. It's not a big ticket item. We did talk about the purchase of uh, waste uh, bins for dogs uh, during the budget deliberations. And I think uh, that was you know, put off to the side. But we all are starting to realize that that park is being used by people walking dogs. And I think it's something we need to look at. And to stop vehicles from racing around the track, in other words, racing around the track, perhaps we put up a farm gate um, so there's no entrance to the track itself. Um, there's other work to be done in Rouse Corners. And as property owners of the property, we, we have to really look at maintaining our properties. We know it costs money, but I think if we do a little bit of this work to clean it up and perhaps monitor it, um, OPP have been notified, uh, even when the building burned down, uh, they're notified, but we're not getting the responses that we would like to see from our OPP. And we know staffing is, is an issue with them as well. But I think we need to, you know, first of all, clean it up and um, you know, start with the small items um, and hopefully people will appreciate uh, the park for what the park is for. Thank you. Thank you. Our administrator clerk, you have some comments? Uh, only that uh, the staff the recreation coordinator has already been um, investigating those items and, and trying to proceed. Uh, the new pavilion that's going to be built at that site is going to be placed in such a way as to deter car traffic into the park as well as as gate so that we've already started the process of looking into that uh are we planning on having a recreation committee of the whole next week as per our normal tumbling schedule that is the normal uh, tumbling schedule right now um having said that there was very little for either the fire and emergency services committee of the whole or the recreation committee of the whole and i was um, going to suggest uh councillor Edie, you were going to get a email from me tomorrow once i confirmed with the fire chief that the committee of the whole meetings be postponed till the next monday um, just before the regular meeting of council uh, but again i'm waiting for some confirmation back from the fire chief before actually suggesting that um, and setting up the meeting for them. So the reason I asked may be obvious. I'm just wondering if um, that might be a good opportunity for a slightly broader discussion around this topic. Something to consider. Yeah, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that once uh, we get into the building of the new pavilion, that's going to assist in a dramatic reduction in the number of cars going in there. Okay, any other member of council have an information item at this point? Okay, um, I'll take advantage of this to uh, explain a couple of housekeeping items as we uh, head into the sunset of this meeting here. Um, we're gonna be doing mot motions and notices of motion and then handling any public questions that might've come in. Uh, and then uh, 
for a number of technical reasons, we're going to be uh, shutting down this particular uh, video streaming meeting and using a different system to hold our closed meeting. And we will be coming out of that closed session, but we will not be going live again for the short open session. The only thing that's going to take place in that short open session uh, is that we will be reporting out in general terms from the closed meeting. And we will be uh, proceeding to deal with our two confirmatory bylaws. That's, they're pretty dry and they're routine. That's just to confirm the, the proceedings of council for its uh, March meetings and April meeting. So that's mostly for the benefit of the public who may be uh, watching and also so the council knows what to, uh, to expect in the next short while. So with that, I'll move on to motions and notices of motion. We have no existing uh, motions. Are there any new notices of motion from any member of council at this time? Okay, seeing none then, I'll move to public question period. And so we'll have to turn to our meeting facilitator to find out whether we have received any questions from the public during our live stream. There have not been any questions uh, that were either emailed to me or posed on the YouTube chat feature. So no questions. Okay, great. So then I am looking for a mover and seconder uh, to adjourn this portion of the council meeting into a closed meeting. And so I see Eleanor or uh, Councillor Renault and Councillor Predijon. So moved by Councillor Renault, seconded by Councillor Predijon. The regular meeting of council adjourn for a closed meeting related to the Municipal Act, Section 239C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality, specifically business park land. All those in favor? And opposed? Okay, that motion is carried. There's a slight delay for the streaming. We'll go silent for a bit here as we end this session and then switch over to the next one. I won't be attending that meeting due to a conflict. Thank you, Councillor Lynn. That's due to your employment? That's correct. Thank you. We can leave the meeting, I believe.